I'm Brian Evans. I'm a uh, faculty member with the Department of Politics and Public Administration here at Ryerson. And uh, obviously on my behalf and on behalf of my department, uh, I welcome you and thank you for, for coming out tonight. Uh, and, well, welcome, I have to say, to the 21st anniversary of the Phyllis Clark uh, Memorial Lecture. And <laughs> come along with 1989 and we're looking forward to the 25th. Um, and of course, we're all looking forward to hearing uh, Bill Fletcher Jr. Uh, evaluate and comment on uh, American politics, the Obama presidency, and what all that means for American workers and, and trade unions. Uh, I want to acknowledge the generous support of QP Ontario and uh, QP Locals 233, 1281, and 3904, uh, who provided generous funding to, to enable us to bring Bill Fletcher and in the future people like Bill Fletcher uh, to Toronto to, to deliver the, the Phyllis Clark uh, lecture. So thank you very much, QP. Now we have a few, uh, few in short, formal uh, uh, procedures. And I want to begin by inviting Don Elder, the president of QP 3904, uh, to provide a bit of background about Phyllis Clark. And, and this lecture, which has now been going on for 21 years and, and hopefully long into the future, uh, is, is carried on in, in her name and in her, her spirit politically uh, and, and, and her, her commitment, her very deep commitment to social justice. Thank you. Thank you and good evening everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce this part of the uh, lecture tonight. And um, Phyllis Clark was way before most of us, I think, but uh, some of the details are, are very interesting. She died on March 21st, 1988, having lived a life devoted to socialism, trade unionism, feminism, community activism, and teaching. A longtime member of the Communist Party, she ran, unsuccessfully, for elected office on several occasions. Phyllis joined the Department of Politics at Ryerson in 1977, and helped define its commitment to intellectual inquiry and social justice. One colleague wrote in a memorial tribute in the Socialist Studies Bulletin that with Phyllis passing, quote, socialism has lost a champion. There are lots of good stories about Phyllis Clark. She apparently smoked heavily and carried a portable auction tank around at the same time, and apparently she managed to work both at the same time. <laughs> Phyllis was active in labor struggles from the 1940s onward. She was a founding member of the Graduate Assistance Association, which became later the Canadian Union of Educational Workers and in, 19, in 1980, and then later amalgamated with the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE. This was in 1995. For the CUEW, she undertook one of the first studies in Canada of the unequal place of women faculty members in Canadian universities. And in memory of Phyllis Clark, we at CUPE and CUPE Ontario and the local Ryerson CUPE locals are honored to help fund this lecture tonight. Thank you. And now for the entertainment, I'm going to call upon uh, Sam Gindin to do a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. <laughs> for those of you who were last year, he, he did a... Uh, well, didn't, didn't really perform one, but came close enough anyway, it's quite entertaining. Uh, Sam is a former uh, senior economist of the Canadian Auto Workers, uh, and is currently the uh, Packard Chair in Social Justice, I believe, at York University. Sam? Sorry to disappoint you all. I'm not going to sing. Uh, Bill's been a, a welder, a union organizer, a community activist, a university lecturer, uh, a labor educator, and a labor historian. He's the author of one of the, uh, the best books around on the crisis in the American labor movement, and I've probably forgotten a whole bunch of other things uh, that Bill has done. He's currently the executive director of Black Commentator, and he's the director of field services and education for the American Federation of Government Employees. What's distinctive about Bill, and I think has been most important to me, has been his strategic clarity. Bill's been the go-to guy whenever progressives anywhere have tried to strategize and think about what needs to be done. And he's done it in a way that's always started with uh, a serious and sober analysis of where things are at, where the balance of forces, what capacities do we have, 
and also at the same time paid a lot of attention to the details uh, of, of tactics uh, because he is such an organizer. Uh, when the AFL-CIO had that one, unfortunately, very brief moment when it looked like there might be possibilities in terms of renewal of the labor movement, Bill was one of the people that they called in to try to transform the labor movement to make new things possible. And more recently, uh, I've been involved in uh, a project in Toronto which has been trying to form a class-based, community-rooted, new kind of organization to come out of this crisis, the Greater Toronto Assembly. And the inspiration for it comes from uh, a talk that uh, Bill gave about five years ago. Uh, the other thing that I, I think has really struck me always about Bill is that Bill has never shied away from the complex. Uh, he's also struggled, he's always struggled with the question of how do we deal with reforms that people need without getting trapped into reformism? How do, you, how do, we, how do we deal with class and race without reducing one to the other? How do we always, how do we fight nationally but always maintain a universalist and internationalist sensibility? And most important, Bill has really been a model for coping with the question, I don't want to say he's answered it, but coping with the question of struggling with how does, and this is in the spirit of Phyllis Clark, how does one act consistently like a revolutionary, like a socialist, in non-revolutionary times? Bill. Thank you. Good evening. I um, want to thank uh, Ryerson. I want to thank uh, QP uh, for sponsoring this talk. I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to ex uh, express my appreciation for that introduction. Uh, that was very thoughtful. Um, what I want to speak about this evening is about the moment. And I want to begin somewhere that I actually did not expect to begin. There's been, in the last number of years, a proliferation of end-of-the-world films. Um, the Day After Tomorrow, uh, Children of Men, Quarantine, etc. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm a science fiction uh, fanatic. And I, and I realized I can't watch these end of the world films anymore. Um, precisely because they're very depressing because they talk about the end of the world. Um, but the question is, what is exactly does this represent? And what I realized is that the world is ending. And that's what these films do in fact represent. They're not ending in the it's not ending in the 2012 sense, you know, where everything is crashing and a few rich people get off on spaceships. It's, it, it's not ending like that. It's ending in a way, particularly for those of us in the global north, it is, it is the end of a certain uh, uh, life, a certain approach to life, uh, a certain set of assumptions that many of us have grown up with and have existed to, to a great extent since the 1930s. And this end of the world is what Hollywood and various writers are tapping into, this fear that's palatable, that we don't know quite what is going to happen. And in the face of that fear, it's very, very easy to fall prey to despair and retrenchment. And I would argue that we have to counterpose end of the world with Shakespeare's journey to the undiscovered country. And that we on the left need, be, need to be those that articulate the notion of the journey to the undiscovered country. That the future is not something for us to fear. It's something for us to embrace. It's something for us to be excited about. The immense possibilities. Yet it's the political right that plays on the end of the world. And what, what, we have, what we've been seeing in the global north with the rise of various right-wing populist movements, 
you know, militia movements, uh, the movement that gave rise to um, Prime Minister Haider in Austria, the late Prime Minister Haider, the Northern Leagues of Italy, uh, and others, is that this end of the world phenomenon is not, it, it is tapping into this right-wing populism, this idea that something is fundamentally wrong and the world that people grew up with has to be defended. This comes in the context of what I would argue to be the convergence of three great crises uh, that we're facing. An economic, an environmental, and the crisis of the legitimacy of the state. And I wanted, to, I wanted to start here because I think it helps us to understand some of what's going on in the United States and the, the political setting. The economic is a, a crisis of capitalism generally, but particularly neoliberal <coughs> globalization in particular. And, and what I want to say about neoliberal globalization is that there's a mistake that's often made when we're, when we're using that term globalization. And particularly I notice it in the labor movement. Uh, this idea of, of an identification of globalization with the idea of a global economy. And global, the global economy, we've had a global economy since 1492. You know, with the slave trade and the invasion of the Western Hemisphere, we've had a global economy. And I'd argue that there have been three rough periods of, um, or roughly three periods of, of the global economy. 1492 to about 1830. 1830 with the rise of British hegemony and free market, uh, free, free trade, to about 1914. And then sometime in the late 60s through now, a third period. And it's this third period that we can really describe as globalization. Because what we're witnessing is not simply the existence of a global economy, but a restructuring of global capitalism that is made possible through certain technological advan advances, but is not the natural evolution of the economy. It's an evolution or it's the result of decisions that have been made by political actors in response to a particular kind of stagnation that capitalism has faced. And this globalization that's taken a certain form brings with it an increasingly authoritarian political side, something that I believe that we've been witnessing since the uh, late 1970s, or early 1980s, where there's been a, a shrinking of the space for acceptable political discussion. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is if you look back into the early 1970s, in terms of what was considered acceptable political discourse, it seems almost extreme by today's, compar uh, by today's standards. That, that what is allowed to get on at least US television is very different than what was once permitted. Um, what is defined as liberal, or liberal in the US political sense, is, is phenomenal. That when you think that, for example, Bill Clinton's domestic policies were to the right of Richard Nixon's. Um, and that shows you what has happened in that 30 to 40 year period. So we have this economic crisis. We have a global environmental crisis that's gotten a great deal of attention. And if you've been following any of the news from the United States, you'll know that in the last few weeks, the Republican Party has demonstrated conclusively that there is no global warming. And the reason is because we had two major snowstorms. Um, no exaggeration. I mean, you may have missed this. But, but it, watching it, I was, I was there in Washington in the middle of those snowstorms. Watching it and watching the way that the Republicans mocked the notion of climate change and global warming because we had these snowstorms, it was amazing. It was amazing that it was given any credence in mainstream news uh, uh, circles, but they nevertheless did as part of the counterattack to this notion of uh, climate change. And part of the problem, and what's even scary, is see, they're the lunatics, but what's scary is that regular people go for this. And they, they start to accept this, and we have to ask ourselves, why do they accept this? Why do regular people, increasing number of people in the United States, question the science of climate change? And I think part of the problem and part of the responsibility falls to us. 
many of us, particularly in the environmental movement. You see, I think what we have to recognize is that it's not enough to present people with the facts of climate change. You know, the facts don't speak for themselves. People speak. And when people speak, facts are interpreted. When you provide fact after fact about climate change, and basically the only conclusion is that the world is coming to an end, people then decide how they're going to address that. And one clear way is absolutely total denial. It can't possibly be that bad. There must be something wrong with your facts. If you're not providing solutions, then people can fall into various kinds of denial, or they'll just say, please pass the joint so that we can just relax until it ends. Right? I mean, so we have to realize that part of our, our task is not simply providing facts, but providing analysis and, our, and, and hope. And the hope must be founded or grounded in, in that analysis. So that's a second crisis. The third crisis is the crisis of state legitimacy, which is not getting a great deal of attention, but is very much rooted in the, uh, in the economic crisis. One of the problems that has resulted from uh, neoliberal globalization is a massive wealth polarization on this planet, unlike any that we've seen in history. Uh, and, and one fact that I continue to repeat is that 225 individuals have more wealth than the bottom 47% of the world's population. I mean, just a phenomenal statistic. Um, but that plays itself out in various countries along similar lines. And, and so what we have is this massive polarization, an accumulation and holding of wealth by a small number of people, meaning that those at the bottom are forced to fight it out. And when you add to that the attacks that neoliberal globalization has undertaken on the public sector and the strangling of resources and the ideological assault on the notion that the state should in any way play a redistributionist role. And what you end up finding is that people at the bottom are fighting a fight, a sort of Hobbesian war of all against all for survival, which can take a, a myriad of different forms, most extreme being the Rwanda genocide. Right? But it can take other forms. In the United States, the rise of these militias over the last 20 years where you have people redefining the notion of community and giving up on the idea that the state, whether in the form of a city, county, or a state, or the national government, can in fact protect them, and that they in fact have to protect themselves. And this redefinition of community has incredible racial overtones. The, these militias in the United States that have been uh, uh, arming themselves are not arming themselves with zip guns. They're not arming themselves with 22s. They're arming themselves with machine guns, with bazookas, with, with mortars, with light artillery. I mean, they are expecting some sort of Armageddon, and they are redefining who it is that they think of as the people. And globally, we see this problem of the crisis of the legitimacy of the state. Is the state an actor? that can play a role in the redistribution of wealth. And it's in that context that we had this election last year. Um, and we elected a man who was seen by many as sort of the anti-Bush, uh, at least in the popular imagination. And what was phenomenal about the, the rise of Barack Obama was two things. One was tapping into this incredible anger with the eight years of the Bush administration, but also the great desire to see something dramatically different happen uh, in the United States and, and globally. But the other thing that was phenomenal was the way in which we engaged in an amazing amount of magical and wishful thinking. Um, there was the lack of a uh, real concrete analysis of who Barack Obama was, what his actual politics were, and, and what we could see happening in Obama administration. Um, Leo Panage was reminding me of uh, uh, a discussion that we had a, a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, when I was here at the invitation of the Toronto Labor Council. 
And, and one of the things that I warned them at the time was that in Barack Obama, there was a tendency for people to see what they wanted to see. And I'll give you one example, which has to do with the wars. In 2008, during the campaign, Barack Obama was elevated by his opposition to the Iraq War. Um, he made it clear that he was against the Iraq War. He also made it clear, for anyone that was listening, that he was not opposed to the Afghanistan War. He, he made that very clear. Um, he also made it clear early on, and some people mocked him, that he was prepared to carry out military strikes in Pakistan if necessary. I mean, he made this all clear. But there were many of us in the United States that refused to hear that. We just shut our ears. And after he was elected, we drew a conclusion that was completely erroneous. The conclusion was that someone who was so strident in his opposition to the Iraq War had to have somehow absorbed some of that anti-war sentiment and it would translate into his approach on Afghanistan when there was absolutely no foundation for believing that. And therefore, when he decided to deploy troops to Afghanistan, it was a mistake when people said that he betrayed us. He didn't betray anybody. I mean, he was actually very clear. He was actually very consistent. The problem was that again and again, there was a tendency for many forces, liberal, progressive, and left, to see what they wanted to see, in part out of our anger and desperation for change. This does not mean that I, for example, uh, recant in terms of the support that I gave for whatever that was worth, uh, for the Obama candidacy, I think that it was the right thing to do. But the problem is that in engaging in, in such an effort, we have to be very, very clear what it is that we're supporting and where are the challenges. So I would say to you, as I've been saying for a number of months, that there actually are three Obamas. There's first the Obama the individual. And the Obama the individual is a very nice looking, incredibly smart, very eloquent, incredibly thoughtful individual who I actually believe has a, has a good heart. Um, he is also someone who has an irresistible impulse in the face of controversy to jump to the middle and attempt to build a consensus around a middle position. He is not someone take a, a leading position and fight it out towards some sort of compromise. He assumes that you build a compromise by jumping to the middle. It's sort of like if you're going to buy a car and someone says that the car is $30,000 and you want to spend fifteen, dollars and uh, you say to the, uh, the car dealer, all right, I'll give you twenty-eight. dollars Now you know full well at that point what the owner is going to say. You know, they, you know full well that you've given away everything. Obama has this absolute impulse, as does the rest of his administration, towards that. And it's related to this fixation on what they call bipartisanship, which is a complete illusion. And, and should very well have been a, a, a clear uh, illusion from the beginning. So you have Obama the individual. Then you have Obama the administration. The politics of the Obama administration are center-right. Um, they're not very different from those of Bill Clinton. And in fact, they're not very different from what Hillary Clinton was running on. The difference between Obama and Clinton, or Hillary Clinton, was not so much in their platform, but in their base. And in, in the way that the base was becoming energized and what their bases were, their respective bases were looking for. But the Obama administration is in fact a center-right administration. And it was very clear from the beginning, that is, from immediately after the election, the tendency that things were moving. Uh, you know, before the election, I was asked by many people, should there be a honeymoon period after President Obama was elected, assuming he was elected? And I said, yes. And they said, how long? I said, 24 hours. <laughs> well, that's what people did. Everyone started laughing. And I said, no, I'm actually very serious. 24 hours. 24 hours we party, and on the 25th hour, we're on this case like white on rice. We do not give him any space. Well, people poo-pooed this, but let's just examine 
two things that happened in the first 24 hours following the election. Larry Summers, a very complicated individual, let's say, um, was, his name was floated to be the Treasury Secretary. Larry Summers, who was one of the people who was directly responsible for the fiscal mess that we found ourselves in, and has a number of other problems that will not uh, be discussed in some on tape. Um, but he has a number of problems. His name was floated to be Treasury Secretary. Now, he wasn't made Treasury Secretary, but the fact is that his name was floated and he became part of the inner circle of the Obama administration. Not Joe Stiglitz, not Paul Krugman, but Larry Summers. So what else happened in the first 24 hours? This right-wing Democrat from Chicago, uh, his name gets floated to become the chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel. So within the first 24 hours, certain signals were being sent as to where the administration was going. So while many of us were caught up in the historic significance, and there was a historic significance, I'm not trying to poo-poo it at all, of this election, there were things that were going on and we were letting it happen. And within the African American movement in the United States, in addition to the profound joy and excitement of an African American being elected, there was a tendency to say, we're going to have to give him an incredible honeymoon period because he's going to be under a lot of pressure and we've got to give him space. The problem was that the other side wasn't giving any space. In fact, corporate America and then uh, the, the uh, right-wing populists, I'll get to in a second, weren't giving him any space at all, and were making it very clear what sorts of signals they wanted. And one of those signals was what was going to happen to the financial institutions that were allegedly too big to fail. Um, so that's the second Obama, uh, Obama. The third is the Obama that people voted for. And that was the Obama of hope, and transformation. And that is what distinguished the Obama candidacy from the Hillary Clinton candidacy. There were a number of people that were back in the Hillary Clinton candidacy because they thought that it would be significant historically for a woman to be elected president, and it would have been. But beyond that, there was very little else that the candidacy of Hillary Clinton represented. Whereas in the popular imagination, the Obama candidacy looked to many as an opportunity to transform the United States domestically and internationally. And that is what people were looking for and were galvanized for. And that is what people have been very disappointed in. Disappointed to the point of a level of despair and demobilization, which I'll get into. Um, now, what did the right do after Obama was elected? It was actually very interesting. A year ago, this time, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, there were discussions in, mainstream, in the mainstream US media about the end of the Republican Party. Just, just look back yourself and you can see it, that the Republicans were gone, that they were going to fragment, that it was over. And that didn't quite happen. Um, so what was their approach? I would say their approach was actually quite interesting. First, they didn't know what to make of the election. Um, they were angry, they were stunned, and they weren't quite sure how to address this administration. So their approach became what I call the buckshot approach. That is, they loaded their shotgun with buckshot as opposed to slugs. They pointed it in the general direction of what they wanted to hit. They closed their eyes and pulled the trigger. And they assumed that something was going to get hit and something was. So what starts to happen was, it was within the right-wing media were these uh, jabs at Obama. Um, the, uh, one of the examples was, was when uh, Rush Limbaugh basically came out and said, I hope he fails. Now this was a very significant statement to be made, you know, to openly call for the failure of a new administration. But once he did that, it was almost like the floodgates opened up. And then we started to see the irrationalism of the political right in, in full display. And there's a couple of things that I found interesting. One was the birther movement. Now, I don't know um, how much you follow the birther movement. And I have to always now explain what the birther movement is 
because of an incident that happened a few months ago when I gave a speech. I gave a speech, I was talking about the birther movement, and this guy got up and charged out of the room and was just absolutely furious. And I was amazed. How could there be such a, I mean, and this was a union audience, how could there be someone that was so reactionary there? And I found out later that the guy thought I was referring to the anti-abortion movement. Um, now, let me explain what the Bertha movement is. Um, the Bertha movement is something that uh, emerged in 2008, then disappeared, then reemerged in uh, the late winter of uh, uh, early spring of 2009. It's a movement that basically says Barack Obama was actually not born in the United States, that he was born somewhere else, maybe Hawaii, um, and, and that therefore he is not truly a citizen and therefore cannot be the president of the United States. Now, what's interesting about this is that these folks really believe this. And I'm going to give you a statistic you may or may not have heard, but it tells you a great deal about the United States. 58% of the Republican Party believes that Barack Obama either was not born in the United States or there's sufficient doubt as to his actual country of origin. 58% of the Republican Party, right? Now, I wish I could just stop there and move on, except for this one little piece, that there's a, there's a side to the birth of movement that's very, very ominous, besides their insanity. And, and right, that's pretty ominous. But the, the side is that there's active organizing within the US military and within the police apparatus to promote the idea that, the, that there should be a coup against Obama to remove him because he is unconstitutionally the President of the United States. There's in fact a political movement that I stumbled across in Montana uh, when I was there doing a training. And, uh, it, and I forgot what the movement is called, but it's a strange movement that basically believes that they are the true repositories of the Constitution, and that their job is to make sure that the Constitution is respected. And they're going around getting people in the military and the police establishment to pledge to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And these are people that are very much affected by the birth of war. So you have this rise of this right-wing irrationalism uh, that, uh, and which then takes the form of things like the, uh, the Tea Party movement and, and others that have been on, on the assault. Um, you have a sort of, almost you could call neo-revanchism, this deep, deep revenge seeking within the right. And, and all of this becomes very important in understanding sort of what we're up against um, in terms of how we take on both the Obama, Obama administration but also facing the right. Underlying the right's critique is racism. And underlying their critique is this idea, and including within the birther movement, is how is it possible that a black man could have been elected president of the United States? The answer is it's not possible, right? It's just simply not. So they draw these other conclusions. Here's another one, that ACORN, the Association for Com of Community Organizations for Reform now through the election. Now, this is one of those, again, this incredible leap across this Grand Canyon that the ACORN, this relatively small community-based organization, had that amount of power in key districts to throw the election. I, I mean, this is amazing. But again, massive numbers of members of the Republican Party believe this. Again, it helps to reinforce the basic notion that it's simply not possible for a black man to have legitimately been elected president of the United States. It can only have happened by electoral theft or by uh, some other um, shenanigans. Um, the political right is doing, is, is tying into or tapping into this larger sentiment, and it goes back to this issue of the end of the world. They're tapping into the collapse in the lives 
of large numbers, masses of white Americans. And the problem here for white Americans is that this was simply not supposed to happen to them. It just simply wasn't supposed to happen to them. That, that, that there had been these promises that had been made to them for year after year after year as to what the future would guarantee. That with rising productivity, so would rise wages. That the lives of their children would always be better than their lives. That this would happen and that there was this deal. But the deal has been broken. And there is a search for enemies. There's a search for enemies. There's a search for explanations. And right-wing populism, which is always like it's something I call the political herpes in capitalism. <laughs> it's always latent in the system. And when the immune system weakens, this comes out and emerges in all of its ugliness and creating immense amount of pain. And that's where you know, the right-wing populism is doing that again. It arises out of the system. It's not that it's ever disappeared, but it's been beneath the surface. But now with the emergence of this black president, in a period where we have the convergence of crises, the right-wing populists are offering answers. And their answers are very consistent with the myths of US history. OK. So we're up against this. The, but then we have the, the very specific challenge of the Obama administration itself. So many people, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I mentioned before about magical thinking. A lot of people voted for Barack Hussein Obama. A lot of other people voted for Barack Merlin the Magician Obama. <laughs> and they believed that shortly after inauguration that everything was going to be resolved. That everything, that the economic crisis would be resolved, we'd be back to work, we'd have all these green jobs, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that the wars would be over, et cetera. And it didn't quite happen that way. Both, there were certain decisions made by the Obama administration, but there were also certain things that did not happen. And in the face of that, this despair started to emerge among many of the Obama supporters. Despair and paralysis. And, and it started to remind me of what had happened in the Clinton era, where many forces that were very responsible for getting Bill Clinton elected, once he was elected, refused to put any pressure on him, defended him against when he carried out indefensible positions, but nevertheless defended him and took the point of view that we had to stand up to him because to do otherwise was giving aid and comfort to the, uh, the other side. We're seeing a recurrence of that, and we start to see it almost immediately. The right wing, however, picked up on this. The right wing picked up on the fact that many people were getting very discontented that there was all this attention being paid to the financial institutions and stabilizing them. And frankly, it may not be a very popular thing for a leftist to say, I actually don't think he had any choice on that. I think that the question was more how it was going to be handled rather than it was whether it was going to be handled in terms of dealing with the financial institutions. But the, the more important thing was that very little was done to address the growing crises that regular working people were facing as unemployment was going up, as we're dealing with this issue of health care, et cetera, and as we're dealing with chronic um, unemployment. So we've had these half measures. We had Obama start the campaign around health care reform. Now, there's been arguments as to whether or not in the face of this economic uh, recession or depression, you take your pick, that he was correct in starting on health care reform. I actually think that he was. I think that he was. I thought it was actually a very smart move. The reason I thought it was a smart move was that he probably knew that the midterm elections, even if he did well, would mean some loss of Democratic seats in the House and the Senate. Therefore, he had two years to make this move on health care before the Republicans might sw switch the balance. So I think that from that standpoint, it made perfect sense to move on health care. The problem was that the problem was what he moved. The problem was that instead of starting his position with a demand for single payer Medicare for all, he starts with this convoluted situation and description of a program that confused everybody. And in that confusion, 
the right-wing populists were able to take advantage and start playing into people's fears. You know, there are these polls that have shown that most people that have health insurance in the United States are okay with the health insurance. But the more important thing is that people fear the loss of their health insurance, and they didn't know or can't figure out what does the Obama plan actually mean for them. In that situation, the right wing got it right. I don't mean that their position is correct. I mean from a tactical standpoint, they got it, that they appealed to people's fears, and they moved in and completely disrupted things. So whereas Obama's supporters were looking at this administration and assuming that what was going to happen was that we would begin this move towards some real health care reform, that in fact didn't happen and people started falling into despair. Various social movements in the face of this discontent again acted like a deer in a headline. Organized labor has been anemic in its response. Anemic in its response first to the financial collapse in 2008, but then in terms of the Obama administration. Instead of putting pressure on the administration, there's been more of an interest and willingness to give them a pass. In fact, in the spring of 2009, there was a national labor leader who made a statement, and I'm not going to say the person's name, but they made the statement that it was better to be in the room, at the table, and get nothing than to be excluded from the room entirely. And I thought that that that's said so much about the state of organized labor in the United States, that people basically felt that it was OK to be in the room have coffee and tea and get absolutely nothing than to be outside, as if being in the room, what, what does that give you? Except for many of the leaders, not just of organized labor, but for other social movements, it's being close to power that gives them that juice, that gives that helps them wake up in the morning, that gives them a sense of self-importance, rather than recognizing that they don't really amount to anything, and that it'd be better to be outside of the room to make it very clear to those inside that we will be knocking at the door and we will knock it down until, in fact, we are heard and until our point of view is factored in on any decision. But many of the leaders are afraid of the consequences. And, in fact, the Obama administration made it clear to some leaders of organized labor who were pro-single payer that if they kept yelling and screaming about, uh, about single payer, and if they kept attacking the administration, that they would, in fact, be excluded. And that seemed to be enough for their chains to be yanked and for them to stop squirming. Um, now, there, may, there is some evidence that some of this may be changing. In the last several weeks, the sort of discontent among many progressives has started to boil over. And it's been taking a number of forms. One form, which is not all that important, is what's happening on the web. And I say it's not that important because I think that many of us uh, that are progressive and left exaggerate that. And because, see, we talk to each other, right? So we have our Facebook pages and our websites and our email lists and everything. And we say the same thing to each other. And then we start to believe that everybody believes it. Um, and this becomes a real problem. We don't, we, we have forgotten what we once knew, which is what the right knows, that you have to combine electronic organizing with face-to-face -face organizing. And face-to-face is the most important part. But there's been a bubbling up. There's been discussions that have been going on. But then there's also been an increasing number of actions that have been taking place uh, around the United States that I think are, are, are noteworthy. Just yesterday, there was a demonstration in Washington during the day that had apparently several thousand people. There was this, these healthcare executives that showed up, and the AFL-CIO and the Service Employees International Union and a number of community-based organizations mobilized to carry out a citizen's arrest of the healthcare executives. And this was, this was quite interesting, and the fact was that the leaders of the movement were themselves prepared to be arrested for taking some action. So, it is that there's some sense that some of this could be changing. But in order for it to change, let me lay out the following, uh, since I'm running out of time. Um, in order for any of this to change, I think that we have to understand 
that the absence of an organized political left means that we're going to continue to see these fits and starts. We're going to see, we'll, we will see resistance, but what we're not necessarily going to see is the cascading of resistance. And one of the things that the left is invaluable for is producing that cascade. If you, you know, just early in 2009, there was a takeover of that factory in Chicago by the uh, uh, members of the United Electrical Workers, uh, Republic Windows. And it was incredible. It was, it was great. The polls indicated that, a, you know, there was massive support in the public for them. And Obama himself spoke out in favor of their demands. It was really great. A lot of people said, now people are going to start taking over factories. Well, it didn't quite happen. Right? And we should have enough history to understand that courageous actions, even when they're victorious, do not necessarily lead to a spontaneous cascade. That's where organization comes in, to promote the lessons. Because again, the facts don't speak for themselves. People can look at what happened in Republic Windows and say, I wish I were in Chicago. Right? Or I wish I was a member of the UE. Or those guys were courageous. I'm not that courageous. We need a left that can promote these lessons and serve as cores in order to guarantee the notion that these uh, things must cascade. A second must be, a, must be an approach. And, and I think that the approach is summarized in the story. Uh, about a discussion that took place between A. Philip Randolph, the uh, longtime president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and one of the architects of uh, two major actions in the African American movement, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And a discussion took place sometime between 1939 and 1941. And, and the story goes as follows Randolph was laying out a list of reform proposals that he wanted uh, Roosevelt to take up. Roosevelt sat there and listened, and uh, when Randolph finished, he said, I agree with you. Now go out there, organize, and make me do it. Right? Make them do it. Make them do it must be the slogan at this moment. It's not just make Obama do it. This is not about an individual. It's about creating a kind of political force on the ground that compels the folks in Congress and the president to do what needs to be done. In fact, Randolph did make Roosevelt do quite a number of things. One of the most interesting was the executive order in 1941 to desegregate the war industry. I, I, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but what was happening is as World War II was gearing up and as the war industry in the United States was starting to plug along and starting to hire people, turned out black folks weren't being hired. Randolph went to Roosevelt and says, said, we need an executive order to desegregate the war industry. Roosevelt said, well, I can't do that. I'll lose the conservative Democrats from the South. Randolph said, fine. We're going to have a march on Washington of at least 10,000 black folks. Now, this is 1941. I mean, you just got to think about the moment. There was no assurance that the Allies were going to win World War II. The Nazis were in the process of moving on Yugoslavia, preparing to go against the Soviet Union. The Japanese were gearing up. These were tough times. And in that, at that moment, Randolph says, 10,000 black folks are going to march on Washington. So Roosevelt got very nervous. So he asked Eleanor, his wife, to go talk to Randolph. And Eleanor was thought of as a sort of left liberal. She goes and talks to Randolph and appeals to Randolph and to his conscience that, that he call off the march and he thanked her very much and says, okay, now 100,000 black folks are going to march on Washington. And at that moment, FDR blinked and the executive order was signed desegregating the war industry in the United States. Right? At a moment in time when some people would say it would be the worst time to take on a friend in the White House. Randolph had the guts to throw the dice and realized that the question was about making this guy do what needed to be done. Fundamentally, that is the situation that we find ourselves in. And the question is, 
whether or not the social movements in the United States will in fact make them do it, or will they repeat what we saw in the Clinton era? And to borrow from Marx, when he said, uh, history repeats itself, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Let's hope that right now we're not living through a farce. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.